cell. So if we're going to understand uh, what proteins are, uh, what they do in the cell, we need to understand a little bit about their actual structure. So um, we're going to break down protein structure into different levels. We have something called primary structure, or secondary structure, tertiary, and quaternary. The primary structure is going to start with the basic unit of a protein. Protein's basic unit is called an amino acid. And amino acids repeat over and over and over again in very long chains. Uh, it could be hundreds or thousands long. Uh, and that's the beginning of the structure. That's what DNA really codes for. Uh, it's coding for sequences of amino acids that are going to be used to build a protein. But that won't actually work or function that string will eventually have to be folded. It will go into the secondary form. We'll look, look at twisting, uh, coil type twisting, a zigzag type twisting, uh, and then it will be folded even more so into very unique, complex three-dimensional shapes. Once it reaches this complex three-dimensional shape in tertiary structure, it may then carry out the function of the protein. Uh, take a while till we get to that point. So what we're gonna just start off with is the, the basic, what is an amino acid? How are amino acids joined together to start to build these chains? All right, and, th and that's the, the first part here. So these two words uh, really can relate specifically to functional groups. Uh, and one of these we already talked about um, in the, the web uh, version here, um, the acid. All right, so uh, an acid gives up hydrogen ions to solution. We had a functional group that had a, an acidic property. It was a carboxyl group, and that's gonna be part of an amino acid. Amino is another functional group that we haven't gone over yet, so, so now we'll see it. When sketching an amino acid, and, and for all amino acids, what we're gonna see is that there are 20 amino acids coded for in the DNA. Uh, all those amino acids are gonna have essentially the same core structure and then one part of that structure that's unique, that makes gives each one its a particular identity. So what's the common part about all the amino acids? Well, they're all gonna have this thing called an alpha carbon, which is really at the, the center of the amino acid. Start there with that central carbon. Building off that, well, amino, all right, let's look at that one. Amino is a functional group, which is NH2. Okay, so an amino group is NH2. That's the functional group. An amino functional group acts as a weak base, which means uh, this nitrogen is more electronegative than the hydrogens. Uh, so it's going to have a partial negative charge. So this is polar. Uh, and then it's going to attract hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions may come in here uh, giving us a charge. So we might see NH3 plus as the amino group, but that's in the charged form, or we may see it uh, just like I drew it here with NH2. So keep that in mind. You may see it in alternate versions. So amino and then acid I already mentioned is the carboxyl group. The one thing you have to remember is when you draw a carboxyl group, it has a carbon. That's part of the functional group. If you forget the carbon and you just draw the other oxygens off of this carbon, it's incorrect. And you'll know so uh, because if you count the number of bonds, the, they really won't make any sense. So this carbon, which is part of the carboxyl group, has a double bond to an oxygen, a single bond to an oxygen, who's a hydroxyl group, which has an OH. Remember, this group acts as an acid uh, because it can donate or give up hydrogen ions to solution. And that's also going to be reversible to weak, weak acid. So we could see it in a charged form with COO negative um, giving it that charge. Down here below this carbon, below the central alpha carbon, we'll also see a typically a hydrogen. So 19 of the 20 uh, amino acids, you'll see that. And then up top, right here, is what's called the R group. So the R group is what makes each amino acid unique, which we'll get to in just, just a second. So to go back to this, you're going to be asked to draw an amino acid, a simple amino acid, not any particular one, but just the generic version. What does amino acid look like? So very simply, a central carbon, an amino group, a carboxyl group, hydrogen, 
and R. And that's it. So you're not going to have to do this specifically. If you're in a biochemistry course, you're then going to need to learn the R groups and be able to draw those 20 structures. Um, but for the, the course uh, that this web uh, video is intended for, it's an intro biology course on cell biology. Uh, we just need to know this part of the structure. Okay. So we're going to look at eventually how amino acids are joined together to, with peptide bonds to build chains. But for right now, we're just going to keep looking at the other part of the amino acid, which is the R group. The R groups, as I said, there's 20 of them. They're going to be broken down into the four categories. So those four categories are polar, nonpolar, acidic, and basic. So one thing you may be thinking about, as, as I said that, um, that there are some amino acids that are called polar amino acids. There are some amino acids that are referred to as the nonpolar amino acids. Some are referred to as acidic, some are referred to as basic. But if you look at the structure that I just drew over here, and you look at it for a second, you might say, well, wait, isn't, isn't this polar? So that bond should be polar, and that bond should be polar, and that bond should be polar. If you remember, go back to the previous video about um, covalent bonds and whether they're polar or nonpolar and electronegativity. Uh, if you're not clear on that, review it. Uh, same thing here, polar, polar, polar bond. So this is a polar molecule. So how could we have a nonpolar uh, amino acid? And that's because when we assign these categories, polar, nonpolar, acidic, and basic, we are specifically talking about the R group. We're not talking about the rest of the amino acid. We know all the amino acids are polar and acidic and basic all right, on their own. It's what does the R group bring that makes it additionally unique, another property. These are going to be tied up in other bonds that build the more complex polymer. It's the R groups that are going to be sticking off them like little flags that then give that area a characteristic. Uh, so that characteristic of the area of the polypeptide could have a whole bunch of nonpolar groups sticking off it. That means that there are carbons and hydrogens all sharing electrons equally, and that's what's going to make up the R group. So that's what we would call a nonpolar amino acid, where the R group is made up of carbons and hydrogens. A polar R group is going to often have... Uh, hydroxyl group or a sulfhydryl group as part of it. So adding additional polarity to that part of the amino acid. Acidic and basic R groups are then going to have extra carboxyl groups, but in the R group. So this carboxyl group will always be here. But if you have what's called an acidic amino acid, that means you'll also find a second carboxyl group as part of the R group here. So if this was the core amino acid here, the nitrogen, carbon, the carboxyl group, then sticking off it, this here, that's the R group, right? And you can see here's a carboxyl part. And then lastly, same thing for basic. So the basic R groups are going to have the amino part of the R group to allow this to be basic as well. So to pull in hydrogen ions, this will give up hydrogen ions uh, acting as an acid or acting as a base. All right, so hopefully that part makes sense. So what is an amino acid? What is an R group? That's how each of the different ones are um, subdivided or, or characterized. So what we want to do next is look at how do we join amino acids together. So a single amino acid can have a role within a cell. But typically, amino acids are going to be joined together in chains. Now, little short chains of amino acids are called peptides. And those peptides are often cellular signals. Think about this. They can, it can be very unique because with 20 different amino acids that can be combined in any order and at varying lengths, it's like using letters of an alphabet to create words. So we can have the same one repeated three times. We could have three different ones. We could have four or we could have five. And they can be in different orders and different amino acids. So there's a whole variety of combinations which makes them unique as signals. So many hormones within the cells are peptides. Okay, So a peptide, that's a short group of these amino acids. The proteins, though, as I said, are going to be complex polymers. They're going to be hundreds or thousands of these amino acids long that then take on a variety of unique types of folding, which we'll get to in 
future, future lectures. So right now we're at the primary structure and we're going to start to assemble a little chain of amino acids together. So we're going to do this by, and to save time, I'm not going to just keep switching colors. We'll just use uh, one color here. So our core carbon, we put here amino group, carboxyl group, hydrogen below our group up here. Now, if you recall, uh, again, in a previous uh, web video, we went over sugars and how sugars are joined together with something called a condensation reaction. So a condensation reaction. Remember, remember that word condensation? We usually think of water and water is made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So what's gonna happen here is these two amino acids are going to join together and we're going to form a water molecule. The way I drew it here, I put this amino group next to the carboxyl group. And there's a, a reason for that. You could say, well, we could form a water molecule if we flipped it around and we put this carboxyl group to carboxyl group. And potentially uh, that could happen, but that's not what happens because the enzymes that join these together are part of something called a ribosome. And that ribosome binds to these amino acids in a specific way as they're attached to things called transfer RNAs. It's very specific in the way in which they can grab them and orient them together. Only an amino group and carboxyl group will ever face each other when this bond forms. So there's no other way to draw the peptide bond, which is what we're going to draw. And the definition of the peptide bond as well is going to be a covalent bond between a carbon and a nitrogen. It has to be that way. So. The condensation reaction will form a water molecule and a new bond. And that bond is what we call a peptide bond. So peptide bonds are always between a carbon and a nitrogen. It's a covalent bond. Covalent. And it, be, it is a single bond, uh, the sharing of electrons but it's going to behave as a double bond. So a double bond behavior. And I say, well, what, what does that mean? How does a bond you know, behave? Well, think of it like this. If this amino acid here is reduced to just this little block, okay? And here's the second amino acid. And we join them together with a single rod like this. Well, this can rotate, right? We can, it, it can spin, okay? Just like a wheel can spin on a single axle. But if we were to take another rod, let's say, and join these two together, two wheels, say, together, well, then they could not move independently of one another, right? They, they would be fuse and they would always have to maintain the same orientation with one another. That's what happens because of the electronegativity involved uh, in this bond. Uh, the way they share electrons, the behavior makes this bond rigid, which means there is not this type of twisting and flexibility. They have to be uh, moving together in this particular area. And that's something that later on affects the, the secondary structure and the possibilities that we have there. So amino acid is joined to another amino acid through a condensation reaction that forms water and the peptide bond between a carbon and a nitrogen. It has to be that way. It's only that way. And then, you know, we'll look at another one. This starts to form the chain. So again, now we'll do our central carbon, amino, carboxyl, okay, so what are these R groups? Right now, it doesn't, doesn't matter. They could all be the same. They could be three different R groups. They could all be polar. They could all be non-polar. They could be polar acidic basic. Um, that's the uniqueness of each protein and polypeptide is the order in which they are assembled. Uh, so again, one, one more time, we take these out to make a water molecule, remove them and the bonds. And then we create the new bond, the peptide bond. Uh, 
and that's it. And so now we have one, two, three amino acids joined together. So we have a small polypeptide that's forming here. And this chain would just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow uh, to give us a very long polypeptide. Right. That's what we call primary structure. So primary structure primary structure is the sequence of amino acids okay so sequence of amino acids is how we defined uh, the primary structure the other thing to know about primary structure that you may be asked is what type of bond forms the primary structure or holds together the primary structure something like that in terms of the wording and so it's held together by peptide bonds which are covalent bonds. So it's a covalent bond, a peptide bond, always between a carbon and a nitrogen. That's the rule. It has to be that way. That's it's only that way. There are no other no other options for it. All right. And that's what you're going to need to know about this aspect of the material. All right. So the first part here now is introduction to um, proteins, which would give more so in the actual class. Um, but now this web sort of uh, version, um, we're just reducing it down to how do you draw the structure. And giving you a few of the definitions okay so simple amino acid r groups can be polar nonpolar acidic or basic the peptide bond forms um, as a water molecule forms we'll get into later in the course more detail about this as we talk about the process of translation which is where rna is read and a ribosome then joins together these amino acids to build the new polypeptide something we'll get to later on in the future but right now just know this part of the structure you should be able to draw this on your own um, if just asked you know draw three amino acids just generically uh, and put them together with peptide bonds label the peptide bond uh, you should be able to do that great